Dad, thanks for coming on. I'm going to hop off. You guys no, can enjoy no, no, your interview. No, no, he can no, have no, his no, moment. No, no, no. Coach, before we dive in, while <laughs> Tasha's <is> here. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode here on You Think, presented by Audiorama. Uh, I promised you guys a big update on last week's show. I told you that I would have an update over last weekend's uh, Pop Warner Regional Championship game that I coach of my oldest son. And I am happy to sit here and record this podcast as a proud regional champion assistant coach of the Pop Warner South Charlotte Patriots. Thank you for the applause. I clapped for myself. Um, It was a blast. We played a really good team out of Raleigh. They hadn't lost in years. They won the championship last year. They are a really good program. They had a team from their program. So there's 9U, 10U, 11U, 12U, 13U. So there's five age groups. They represented the regional championship of what they call the Mid-South, which is us here in, in North Carolina. They represented... Uh, their team from their organization was represented in all five age groups. So it gives you a little idea of that. This, this is a pretty good program. So we knew it was going to be hard. They hadn't lost. They had beaten everybody all year. They won this last year and we won. It was a nail biter. We won seven, nothing. We had three drives that ended inside their five yard line. We only scored on one of them. So that was disappointing. We feel like we pretty much dominated the game. They were really no threat to score on us. And, um, we moved the ball. They were big, they were physical. They were very well coached. So we were very happy. And now it qualifies us to go to the pop Warner super bowl, which is like the national championship where all eight regions of the country are represented. The winners come now down to Orlando for a week of more 11 year old tackle football. So that will be an entirely different, uh, report back. I will keep you guys a pray, uh, you know, up to speed on, what that experience looks like. All the parents and the moms are going crazy booking hotel rooms. And it is, I almost feel like I need to bring back on our guy from pop Warner again and like have him tell us how to go about this because the amount of red tape and booking of rooms and how to put, Oh my God, it is, it is like getting ready to go to the actual super bowl as far as logistics, but the kids are fired up. The families are fired up. If you would have told us that we'd be going down to the national championship of one of eight teams um, in our age group, I would have said you're crazy. Nonetheless, here we are. So I will have more updates to come. Um, I would also, my daughter will kill me if I didn't tell you that she also finished her soccer season and they won the championship as well. So she would kill me if I didn't throw that in there and I talk too much about the boys. So I love her. Um, So that's an update. We are taking this week off for Thanksgiving. We are heading uh, to Dallas. I'm calling the Dallas Cowboys, New York Giants game on Thursday, Thanksgiving day. My entire family is coming. We're going to spend the week in Dallas. And then I'm going to fly from Dallas to Kansas city to call the America's game of the week on Sunday between the chiefs and the Rams. So big week, busy week. Um, so let's get into it. So today's guest is, I can give you a lot of, you know, qualifications and job descriptions. He's the current head coach of Syracuse university, former running back at university of Hawaii. Um, at Manoa, he's been offensive coordinators at Arizona, Texas A&M, um, head coach at Bowling Green, a very accomplished coach, Dino Babers. But more importantly, he is the father of your favorite part of the show. My producer, Tasha, is Dino Babers' daughter. So I had an in of getting Dino. It was really cool to have him come talk a little bit, not only about Syracuse and their program and what he's trying to build there, but just his journey, his journey through athletics, both as a coach, as a father, um, as a husband. So it was a really cool conversation. I appreciate Tasha for setting it up. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this conversation with not only head football coach of Syracuse University, but Tasha's father, Dino Babers. It's nice to set a conversation on a, on a point of a a relationship, right? There's always, it's a good way to start a conversation, Tasha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey dad, thanks for coming on. I'm going to hop off. You guys can enjoy your interview. He could have his moment. No, no, no. Coach, before we dive in while Tasha's here, (laughs) I need, we've heard a lot of other people's youth sports stories. Obviously, since I know you're a huge fan of the show, you know what we talk about here. I need to know growing up in the Babers household what, again, to whatever degree it was, 
I want to hear a Tasha, a young Tasha sports story that you think our fans would love. Well, this is easy. She, love it. I oh, think gosh. she knows exactly where I'm going to go to on this. I know. It's an embarrassing so, one. So, so this, <laughs> Even this better. Is, this, this is how I'll start terrible. off. Terrible. Okay. First of all, all the girls played sports. Okay. So all those young ladies played sports. One thing that, oh, I can't give you that because you guys will get mad. I'll, I'll say it anyway. One day, one of the girls wanted to come and be a cheerleader. And we said, babies, there's no cheerleaders in our family. We don't cheer. We play. That was me. <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm not trying to knock the cheerleaders, but that's our family. We don't cheer. We play. But uh, Tasha, we've, we always said she would be good in track. We always said she'd be good in track. So we finally got her to, to, to get on a track team. And she had, and I may get this story wrong, but she was running track up in uh, Cascade, California when I was at UCLA. And she qualified, I want to say, in seven different events for the national championships in Philadelphia. So I want to say she qualified for like uh, 800. I really like this. It's just me getting grabbed on. The 200. I don't know if it was the 100 or not. The long jump, the triple jump, the high jump. And there was one more thing. It was either shot put or 100. I couldn't remember. She had seven events that she qualified for, for us to, in California, champion, to go all the way to Philadelphia to see if she was a national champion. And then after she qualified for the national championships, she basically said something to the effect, Dad, I just did that for you because you liked it or da-da-da, or I just did it. Now that I've qualified, I really don't want to go to Philadelphia. I really want to do something else. And that's what she no, did. I had, a, I had a soccer tournament the day of the, and I was like, I can't leave my team. But it felt nice to qualify. Well, there you go. That's so everybody happened. wins. Yeah. You would have really won, won the championship anyway if you went. Obviously. Yeah, I thought I thought you were going to tell the story of when I played Powder Puff in Texas and oh. this girl just laid me out and oh. I like blacked out. Oh, and was... you weren't supposed to hit people. Oh. And Greg. it was embarrassing cuz Texas it's like the whole stadium is full and everyone's like, "Oh." And I How got good laid were you? How and... good was Tasha at Powder Puff football? Greg, I I got in I got in trouble by my head coach, Art Bryles. <laughs> we were Wait, a minute. she comes this is First of all, you're in Texas. It doesn't happen in any other state. I, of course. I it only happens in Texas. So it's the powder puff game, and she runs down on the opening kickoff. All, you know, I'm there. There's other coaches there watching their daughters. And uh, she runs down on the opening kickoff. And this was it an older girl or a girl off your soccer team? She was older okay. and on my soccer team. So you Didn't were like play, one though. grade under, one grade under? Yeah. And I mean, great. And I'm. this is not a joke. This is – I'm talking to an NFL guy. Okay, and you're talking to a college head coach. I'm telling you, she got depleted like she was in the NFL and her head wasn't on a swivel. I am not kidding you. Just think about the most violent thing you've ever seen where I jumped up going, oh, my God, she this might be a concussion or something. Yeah. I mean, feet over head, head bouncing the ground. Boom, okay. boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, Texas Powder Puff football is real. So you had to recruit that I, other girl. <laughs> I don't I don't know if she, I don't know if she bounced up two times or or they cleared I I can't remember cuz she got hit so hard. All yeah. I know is she didn't come out of the game and the rest of the game was like just think about Dick Buckness and Lawrence Taylor together because it was nothing but violence coming. I was pissed. <laughs> Did you just take the game over? Did you just dominate the game, Tasha? I got three interceptions that game. Like I was like, fine, <laughs> hit me. <laughs> How proud were you? It was the worst. <laughs> oh my God. I was so proud that I went back the next day and I'm telling all the coaches of in course. the meeting room about it. <laughs> and then finally, finally the head coach, Coach Bryle, said, Dino. It's powder puff football. I'm like, you wasn't there. You didn't see it. <laughs> it. There is nothing better than telling other people's stories. And most of the time they don't care. But when you're telling stories of your kids' events, it's like you're rehashing the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, caught, I was on a production call this week with, um, with Matt LaFleur. And I, I was telling him I had stolen a play off one of their games early in the year from my Pop Warner football team that I coached my kid on. Right. And we got, it was a pretty good, we, we ran it in the game last week and we got pretty good success. I'm holding my phone up to the zoom camera. Like coach, look, look at the play. And like, and then I stopped to think after the call, I'm like, did I really just show Matt LaFleur <laughs> 11 year old football play? And I was, I was like, yeah, 
and he really cared. In my Watch mind, this. he loved it. He, he loved, loved it. it. He Move loved it to the it. left. I can't see the whole thing. Move exactly. It. <laughs> He's like, "What? What are you doing with the split there by your by your split end?" Why? I'm like, we, "Our kids don't understand two plus the numbers yet, Coach. We're, we're working on it." <laughs> It's All, right, Tosh. Awesome. All right, Tasha. All right, Tasha. All right. So, Coach, I, I I know you're in the middle of your season. I want to talk about you know this year at Syracuse again. We recap every week. You guys got off to a six and zero start. You guys are rolling, and we're going to get to that in a second. But I want you to just take us back. I know you got your start. Went to school out in Hawaii. Started there. I think coaching. I'm biased. My father was a longtime high school football coach. I'm biased. I think coaches make as much impact on young kids' lives as any profession. I, but I always love to know like what inspired people. I feel like it's a calling. I feel like it takes a very special person, especially to get to the levels you have in the coaching ring. So just take us back to being, you know, starting as a GA in Hawaii, like what made you want to set forth this career and this long career that you've had kind of going, climbing the ranks and serving all these kids. So many of them you mentioned at the start of the show. You know, it's funny that you would, you would mention that because this started with me. It was a spiritual movement. I mean, I used to be a, short, fat mama's boy that wouldn't come out the house and wouldn't play any sports. I had an older brother, a younger brother. My dad was a semi-pro uh, football player, which meant that he was a military guy that bounced bounced military bases uh, because they had sports teams, Army, Navy, Marines. Yep. Besides universities, they had uh, base teams. And uh, I was just a fat mama's boy that wouldn't come out of the house and uh, kept praying to God what he wanted me to be. And then one day, I think I was seven or eight, he gave me the word coach. And at the time, I didn't even go outside and play sports. So he didn't say football coach. He just said the word coach to me. So then I had to start learning about sports because I really wasn't into it. And uh, and since, since he did, he wasn't very specific, I started playing all kinds of sports. I played, I played baseball. I played basketball. I played football. I ran track. I just did everything in sports so I could find out what sport he wanted me to coach. And to make a long story short, uh, I just ended up being the best at football and uh, got an opportunity to uh, get a scholarship, go to the University of Hawaii. And, uh, and that's when I knew I got a short stint in the Canadian Football League at the BC Lions, got let go. And instead of keep trying and trying and trying on NFL practice squads and all that other kind of stuff, I said, he wants me to be a coach. I'll just start my coaching career there. And that's where I started in Hawaii, two years at Arizona State, won a Rose Bowl at Arizona State with John Cooper, and then uh, uh, got started at Eastern Illinois, the same uh, university where uh, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo's from, uh, Sean, Payton Sean Payton is from Romo. Romo. I was Romo. Say, there's one more, and there's Romo. Yeah, and uh, and then the Shanahan's, uh, the older Shanahan, actually started there with that with that university. So it's it's had a great tradition. Then I bounced around to a whole bunch of uh, Big Ten and Pac-12 schools. Never been in the SEC. Went Baylor and um, Baylor in the Big Twelve. Never coached in the SEC yet. And uh, and it's and it's been my thing ever since. It's never been about money. My first job, I was a full time coach about to get married and I was making 18 five and I bought a cutlass, a two door. You were rich. You were rich for 12, five. So I had $6,000 <laughs> to live off of and get married. Good decision. And I, thought I was rich. And, <laughs> uh, and it's, it's just started from there, but it's always been, I talked about this earlier this week uh, with someone, you know, it's my 34th year and I've never gone to work. I've never gone to work. You and mentioned I that it, I don't have a job. I have a career. I don't have a job. So I've never worked a job. I've always worked a career. And uh, hopefully I've given those young men as much as they've given me. So you mentioned that it, it was a calling and it started as a spiritual calling. You know, looking back on 34 years, still with a lot to accomplish ahead of you, not the wins and losses, just what is the most satisfying aspect of being a coach to you? You're going to love this since you're coaching uh, your son's uh, Pop Warner team. It's when the, when the young men come back or they call you and go, I mean, one of the best calls I ever got was two of my players from Arizona were in a random barbershop and they bumped into each other with their sons there and they're taking their sons to get their hair cut. And then they bring me up and they start talking about how they're doing things with their sons that we did on our football teams. And then the one guy said, I wish I could call and thank Coach Babers 
you know, he, I never knew all the things he was teaching me, how it was going to carry. And then the other guy says, I got Coach Baber's number. And then they call me right there and we get to hit, we put it on speaker. We've got this interaction going on while both of their sons are in barber chairs getting their hair cut. That's awesome. And uh, it's one of the greatest moments. It's one of those memories that will always stay with me and uh, hopefully be with me forever. And, and along those lines, you know, again, as I said, my dad was a longtime coach, never at the college level, but the high school level. And I, I grew up around it. I grew up watching his coaching style. And so much of his coaching style was very similar to his parenting style. We, we joked about, you know, Tasha and, and, her, and her sisters and, and the kids and their, you know, upbringing in sports. How would you compare now your 34 years of style of coaching versus maybe how you approached it when they were small, both through their sports and then also at home? Like, do you see yourself as a parent and a, and a coach kind of in the same mold? You know, it's interesting. You, it's <clears throat> first of all, when you when you become a parent, there's no book, right? right? You don't tell the kids that, you know, so you either do the things that your mom and dad did good. You carry into that marriage instead of, and so does your spouse. And maybe some of the things that your mom and dad did bad, you say, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. I didn't like them doing that. So I'm not going to do that to my kid. So you don't carry it into your, into your, uh, into your family. But the bottom line is there is no book and you two have to work together. And I remember, you know, there's, there's, there's times when you're like, God, are these kids getting it? Is the household really moving in the right? Watch this. You're talking about, is the team really moving in the right direction? Yeah. Is the household really moving in the right direction? Is the, is the brothers and the sisters, is the older brother helping the younger brother or the older sister helping the younger sister? Are they moving in the right directions? And you try to, my big thing in the beginning was to try to keep team and family separated. That's two different things. I found out that I became a better, a better parent when I finally said they're not two different things. They're really the same thing because I, I, there's no doubt it's God, family, football in that order, but there's such a thin line between family and football. And I love both so much. And my kids, if they love me, they know how much I love them and they'll find the same love for that family and that football as well. So in essence, by, if you're asking me how did we, when it ended up, when I thought the family was really, really being raised the correct way is when I started raising them more like I would treat a team. And, and the things I expected from them is no different than the things I expect from my team or members of my team, which I call my family, like my La Familia, my Ohana. Now, I want to hear what, what are those principles? If, if I asked those former players when you were having that call on the speakerphone as their kids are getting haircuts and I said, hey, guys, what was Dino Babers like to play for all those years ago? Or and if I asked a kid right now currently playing for you at Syracuse, what is your style? Well, first of all, you've got precussor and postcussor. <laughs> post okay. <laughs> okay. Got, I, I want to hear about pre. I want to hear precussor. Okay. Well, well, first of all, like I, when I started off every, Everybody, I was too nice. Everybody said, you know, you, you're too nice. You like people too much. You know, you gotta, you gotta get after them more. You gotta cuss them more. You gotta give them that tough love. And I, and, uh, there was a, there was a lot of, there was a lot of other people on the plate and not me. Now I was still getting guys to get better because maybe they could see through all the language and stuff like that, but it really wasn't my personality. My personality is more anti-cuss or no cuss, you know, I can, I'll yell, but it has to be something that you've done over and over again, which means you're not listening. Right. Okay. If you're going to listen to me, I'll coach you up in a normal tone, but if you're not going to listen, then I'm going to get after you. And then after that, I'm going to leave you alone because you don't want to accept coaching. Then you're not going to get it because I think I have a value and you're not taking that with you. But I, the biggest thing was, I think that the, the people if you if you treat people the way you want to be treated, they'll they'll accept it. And I just thought character, integrity, uh, don't steal from me. You know, I used to one of the things I used to test my players is I used to tell them exactly where my wallet was in my office as an assistant. You guys, this is where I keep my wallet. My door is always open. OK, the reason why I'm telling you this is because no one's ever stolen from me. You don't have to steal from me. If you ask, I'll probably give it to you if it's legal. I said, but you don't have to steal from me. And in 34 years, I've only had my wallet stolen one time. Wow. 
That's I mean, talking about putting it out there. I'm putting it out there. I mean, they know exactly where it is. I'm not done yet. You said three things. The second thing is lying. I'm like, you've got to be able to tell me the truth. I'm on your side. You can't tell me something I haven't heard. And if you do, I'll go, wow. I've never heard that before. Okay, let me try to get some information on that subject, blah, blah, blah. Let's see how we can work with this together. So, but if we're going to be in a, in, a, in a coach player relationship, we've got to have truth between us. So there's no way we can get better. Last thing is to me, players, okay, and family members, you know, they got to have CS. Okay, I love, I love book smarts. Okay. I've got daughters with undergraduate degrees and master's degrees. My wife's got them. I got them. Okay. I love book smarts, but to me, there's nothing more important than street smarts. If you got street smarts and now you got book smarts, you got the whole world at your feet. Okay. You've got the whole world at your feet. And that ties in with the last thing that you have to be to be a family member on the team or a family member in our family is you got to have some CS. And CS is an abbreviation. It's an acronym for, can you guess? Common sense. Absolutely. 100%. It's not very common. <laughs> it's not very common. I said, if you're going to be, you're going to be in my family, you better have some common sense. And if you're going to be on my team, you better have some common sense because common sense tells you that you're doing wrong and you need to go do right. Or common sense says, I don't like what's about to happen in this car. You guys need to stop and let me get out and you're going on your own. Or Common sense is, Greg, you're not going to do that. And you're sitting there going, Babers, I'll go right through you. I played in the NFL. You never made it in the NFL. I said, well, Greg, you may go right through me, but you're going to have to go through me because I'm not going to allow you to do that because you're my guy and you're not going to do that. And we need to have that not only on football teams, but we got to have that in family members as well. I'm off my, my podium. I love it. Uh, I want to hear more about who was the, who were those people that were influencing you? You mentioned early on, you felt like maybe you were coaching according to how other people wanted you to interact with the players and wanted you to perceive, like be perceived. And then you've kind of transitioned where you're saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. Like who were those early influences, both good? Like who were the early influences that have shaped your coaching career? And maybe what were some of those voices that you've had to kind of get away from and say, no, I need to be true to myself with how I approach you know, building the culture of this team? Well, I'm going to stay more with the good than the bad, but yeah. just like your long 14 year career, you know, I've got some names to go with. Uh, starting with my high school coach, John Shacklett. First thing he did was, you know, he basically degraded me. <laughs> okay. That's an you interesting know, I walked, approach. I, I walked in high school. I was one of those guys where three, three or four different high schools wanted me and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, out of the out of the four schools, they had all made their pitches. And then the, this one school hadn't made their pitch yet. Morris High School in San Diego. And I I walk into Morris High School and there's the high school coach. They told me what he looked like. And he goes, I go, he says, he goes, hi, can I help you? And I go, hi, I'm Dino Babers. And he goes, I know who in the hell you are. I'm with another guy. OK, the other guy's name was Mark Kennedy. He goes, I know who in the hell you guys are. And I know you guys have been taking the tours and everybody wants you guys to go to your go to this school. But I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to kiss your ASS. If you want to come to school here, come to school here. And if you don't, don't. Now, if you want to ask me any questions about our program, I'll be glad to answer those pro those questions. But you're not getting any da 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 <clears throat> to both of us. OK, we both said we're going to this. school. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's I've, I mean, every, meanwhile, it's like when you go on a recruiting visit, the people yeah. that over recruit and they have to like sell you this pipe dream. Right. I always felt like they were covering for something. They're covering for something. That's exactly right. So that's John Shack would be the first one. Uh, Dick Tomey, my collegiate coach that uh, passed away uh, a year or two ago of uh, cancer. I got an opportunity to speak at his funeral when they took it to the University of Arizona. He used to coach there, head coach at Hawaii, head coach at San, San Jose State. Great man. Uh, um, a guy that, again, just I was 18 to 21, your college coach has a lot of influence on you. And I was already into that coaching thing based off of what I told you to happen earlier in life. So I really copied a lot from him. Uh, and then the Hawaii, living in Hawaii for four or five years, that was different. You know, I came from a school that, I mean, a family didn't show a lot of public displays of affection. And in Hawaii, you come off the plane, you got some strange, 
strange female giving you a kiss because she put flowers around your neck. I'm like, what is going on here? Is this legal? <laughs> you know, and uh, just living there and uh, and being changed your ways on how on what Aloha is all about. Hello, goodbye and love. What it's all about and how they they deal with their aunties and their uncles and extended families getting older uh, really left a big impression on me. The uh, Getting to Arizona State and watching John Cooper, who ended up at Ohio State, operate and move that program to a Rose Bowl in 1987. There's a plaque outside the stadium, still got my name on it. I think that that was absolutely amazing. And uh, one of the sleeping giants in the uh, Pac-12, there's no doubt about it. That's, that's a fantastic program. When I got to Eastern Illinois, it was really, extra, really different because uh, I was working for a guy by the name of Bob Spoo. And Bob Spoo was like a 24-year experienced quarterback guy from Purdue. He had all the great quarterbacks, Greasy and da-da-da. All these great quarterbacks were all coached by him. And, and he had just had a bad experience of being let go. And he just said, you know what? I never want to go Division One football again. I want to stay at this school for as long as I can. So he gave me my first job in 1987. He coached there for 25 years. 25 years. And when he retired, they hired me. And I mean, it's, that's amazing. So I told, you know, I told my family, Hey, we're about to stay here 25 years, just like Bob Spoo. And uh, things didn't work out. Things happened. And, you know, we started winning a lot. And some guy by the name of Jimmy Garoppolo, who they thought was no good, all of a sudden got a lot better and uh, things kind of took off, but uh, still a very special place in my heart. And Bob Spoo, another Another uh, coach had passed away during the COVID uh, thing from cancer. And then after that, kind of bounced around. Walt Harris at Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Jim Coletto at Purdue. Uh, June Jones was my offensive coordinator at Hawaii, which really gave me some innovative looks. So you, when you put that with Art Bryles, with the stuff that he was doing at Baylor that was cutting edge at the time, along with uh, you know the Carl Durrells at UCLA and it was just, uh, you know, and when you talk about UCLA, you got to always talk about probably one of the guys that are Mr. U UCLA, Homer Smith. And uh, Homer Smith was a longtime offensive coordinator at UCLA, longtime offensive coordinator at Alabama that uh, I got the, uh, the opportunity to work with at the University of Arizona when we kind of took off with Lance Briggs and Dennis Northcutt and Tron Candidate and Edwin Muatalu and and Jose Portilla, and I mean, there was just numerous, numerous, numerous Antonio Bri I mean, Antonio Pierce. All these fabulous players was was, was there, and and uh, Homer Smith made a, a, a huge, huge impression on me on how to attack defenses and how to install offenses and to ins inspire young people, you know, to want to do more. So I've been around a long time. I'll get off the subject so you can ask me another question, but. Uh, there's those are the personalities that are within with inside of me uh, when I take the uh, when I take the coaching field. I, I tell I tell my young people this. This is what I'll say and then I'll close. I said, I'm going to be the hardest head coach you ever played for. And they kind of look at me like, coach, I don't feel that way. I said, Here, here's the reason why I said, I, I really like people. I really enjoy people. I'm not going to cuss at you. I'm not going to put hands on you. I'm not going to do that. I said, but. I said, I'm going to be hard for you because when I tell you something, you're going to think I'm playing and I'm not. So I have this line. I said, hey, I'm serious. And when I say that to you, you need to take it as gospel. Don't don't look at. I said, when I tell you I'm serious about something, Greg, OK, if you don't if you don't change your ways, Mr. Olson, if you don't change your ways, I'm serious. You'll never play it down here again. Oh, come on. Come on. I'm like. If I give you that line, <laughs> yeah, you're not. It's not just a throwaway. It's not it's a throwaway not. line meant to scare you and intimidate you, and then tomorrow all is fine. No, it means you brought me to the end of it, and I'm lighting the edge, and it's about to blow up in your face. So there's there's the tag word. Yeah. Everybody in the family knows it. Yeah, but I think as a player, I think back to all the coaches I had. I think all all, especially good players, people you know, players that want to have success, they all they want is they want honest feedback, whether they're ten years old or 35 years old in the NFL and everybody in between. I wanted to know where I stood. I did not want a coach to tell me 
hey, you played well, you played well, good job, good job. But then upstairs, they're trying to get rid of me because they don't think, right? Like I always want, I always felt, and the best coaches that I ever had were the ones that always told me where I stood. I might not have always liked it. I might not have always liked the feedback, but I knew when they told me I played well, it's because I played well. Because if I didn't play well, they were going to tell me. And I, I feel like in today's world, we see it with a lot of the young kids coaches where everybody's so scared to tell people the truth that so many of these kids now, and I'm sure you see it, and we're going, we're going to get to this here in a minute. I'm sure you see it where these kids go their whole lives. And until maybe they get to late in high school or definitely in college, it's the first time everyone's ever told them, hey, that's not good enough, or you need to improve here if you want to play or whatever the case may be. Nobody ever tells kids the truth anymore. And when no. you do, they look at you like you're crazy. It's, uh, you're ruined, you're, you know, there's so many people that are involved with the athletes nowadays and they want to, you know, they, they want to talk about the nice stuff, but they don't want to talk about the stuff that's, that's not so nice. And the kids are all worried about their branding and their social following on the internet. So they don't want to say Babers doesn't want to say anything bad about Olsen because then Olsen will say something bad about Babers. And then that'll mess up how many followers we have or that could mess up our branding. So you don't mess up mine. I don't mess up yours. Let's talk about the positives or not say anything at all. And then when it comes down to coaching, I can't coach you if if you don't receive. Watch this. Receive what I'm saying. I can, you know, I can give you knowledge, but if you don't receive it, you can't, you don't retain it and you can't apply it. Then it's no good. It's no good. It doesn't matter how good of a coach you are anymore. If I don't absorb it. And that's exactly right. So the relationship to me is everything. Now you can like country and I can like Motown. That has nothing to do with it, but our relationship has to be pure. And, uh, I tell, I tell young men all the time, like, Hey, I have knowledge. All right. You want to take it, steal it, and use it as yours. But you can't use it or you can't even reject it if you don't receive it. You've got to receive it. And I said, you can't hear me. Like you and I, we're talking right now. We're not hearing each other. No, we're not. You got some guy going, what is he talking about? I mean, you said he had some degrees. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We're listening to each other. When you hear something, it can go in one ear and go out the other. When you're listening, it goes in an ear and it tumbles around in the dryer for a while and you savor it, you, you taste it and, and, and it, and you can, you can throw it out, but it sat there for a while or you can swallow it and make it part of what you're doing. And my whole thing is you need to listen. Okay. And it, I tell my players all the time, I'm like, Hey, they think I like to talk. I can't stand talking. Oh, I see your stuff on the internet. You're a great public. Can't stand talking. I love listening. I love it. That's awesome. I have a th- along those lines, a little different, but similar. I have a thing with my kids where sometimes, as we all know, talking to your kids, I said right now, I said, listen to me, are you, are you listening to me right now? Or are you just waiting to talk? Right. There's a, you know, you're quiet and I'm speaking, but I feel like you're just thinking in your mind, what your response back to me is going to be. And while you're waiting to talk, you haven't heard a damn thing I've said. So I, I get it. And Again, that's where, that's why I started out with the whole parenting coaching thing. Cause man, at oftentimes it's the exact same thing. Oh yeah. But hey, I want to, you, you mentioned your time. I want to change gears, but I want to stick on the, your time in Eastern Illinois. You mentioned your time there. So you go from Eastern Illinois, proven winner. You guys win fast. You mentioned Garoppolo. You then go to Bowling Green. You take over for Dave Clawson, who I have gotten to know pretty well here at his time in Wake Forest, his his um, sister is a, and husband are a dear friends of ours. They live here in Charlotte. Um, so you take over Bowling Green. All you do is win. So in your head coaching, you know, your last couple stops of head coaching, all you've done, you, t- a couple years ago, you guys win 10 games at Syracuse this year, top 25 team th- through the first six weeks. Like you're a proven winner. Like what about program building and, and establishing culture? What has allowed you to have that track record of success from Eastern Illinois, carrying that over now to Bowling Green, sustaining that success after Dave leaves, now coming to Syracuse, rebuilding that program? When I was coming out of high school, Paul Pascaloni and George DeLeon, Syracuse was a big deal. Late, you know, 99, 2000, 2001, Syracuse being recruited by them was a big deal. You've built them back up to that level. Like, what about the the job of program building appeals to you? 
I, I think the biggest thing is changing the com- changing the community, changing the, the eyes of the university, and then changing the players, uh, how they play. You know, if you want to improve the player on the football field, improve the player off the football field. It's to me, it's a people thing. Some watch this, and it's interesting that you brought this up, Greg, because some coaches want no part of that. They're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to go from this top school to this top school. And I'm not going to leave until I get one of these schools because I want nothing to do with rebuilding. Where I, I look at it, I had an opportunity to not to go to a rebuilding school, and that's what Syracuse was. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, I want an opportunity. That's an opportunity to bring, a, 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 to me, a school that had a, that had a proud football yeah. tradition, proud Jimmy Brown, uh, Ernie Davis, first African American win the uh, Heisman Trophy. Floyd Little, Larry Zonka. I can keep going. Dwight uh, Freeney. Conrad, I can keep going forever. Okay, yep. um, John Mackey, the best tight end. Yep. There you go, John Mackey. Yeah, Syracuse. There you University. go. But it had an unbelievable football tradition. Okay, then it kind of went on pause for a little. Don't get mad at me, alumni. To a, a, an a unbelievable basketball tradition. And I've I've always saw Syracuse kind of the way that I look at UCLA, that yeah they can win basketball championships, but they also have the ability to win a football championship as well, or or lacrosse, or or softball, or you know there's a some of those schools are just different. And I look at the uh, I look at the S on our chest. I look at that as. There's two S's that everybody recognizes. One's east of the Mississippi, one's west of the Mississippi, okay? The one west of the Mississippi is Stanford, okay? The one east of the Mississippi is Syracuse. Both of them are national brands and both of them are international brands. When I'm in Europe, there's people that come up and go, hey, you go to Syracuse? They know, okay? You go, you go to London, there's a Syracuse of London, okay? I mean. Just like there's Syracuse, I mean, this is unbelievable. It's in different countries and stuff. This is a big brand and to have the opportunity, okay, to bring something like that back was just a challenge that I, that I, I had to accept. Yeah. And, and I want to talk about your time now at Syracuse because, you know, you've, you guys, again, a couple of years ago, right before COVID, you guys win 10 games. I think it was 2019, 18 or 19, you guys win 10 games. I know the COVID year 2020 we all went through struggles. The world was upside down. I can only imagine what it was like trying to corral a bunch of college kids and testing. I can't imagine what that was like. Now you fast forward to this year, 2022, you guys start six and zero. Oh, you get into some tough games. You guys go, you have Clemson right there at the end, just fall short. You it's Notre Dame. I mean, you guys are playing again, top, top level wake forest. Talk a little bit about now, just where you feel the program is the the steady ground that you've built what you see the future and what you see the challenges here just for the rest of this year and and trying to reach, you know, bowl game, continue to compete in the ACC. Just where do you see things as you stand today? Launching pad, Mm, launching pad, our foot's on the brake, our foot's on the gas. It's mm, where we are exactly where we want to be. And it's time to, it's it's time to take the foot off. Now, you know, we started off hot six and oh, and and we're in the top 20 and, and all that stuff. And, uh, it's, you know, we're like any other team. When you're rolling along, you're taking some chinks in the armor, you're getting beat up. And then when you start playing against some competition that's up there, it, it gets difficult. It gets difficult. And we, we've we taken three on the chin. Okay, now we're six and three. But, and now it's time to rebound. And uh, we got a tough opponent this week, you know, with Florida State. We'll have a tough opponent after that. And I won't talk about the other's opponents because we take them one at a time. But I like this team. And I think as we start to get people coming back, we're going to be fine. This thing is going to, it's about to take off. And uh, I really believe that we we built up to the 10 win season. We had the COVID thing, which took us down like a roller coaster. But I think we're right now that we're going to be one of those teams that stay around. You know, we've already qualified for a bowl this year. We're going to be one of those teams that stay around and with the right rebuilding, which we're right there about to do. I think we're going to reload and we're going to slowly build this thing back to what everybody anticipated it was going to be. And it's going to be that way for a long time. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but again, I've, I've never stood in front of the room as, as the head coach at any significant level, but I always felt 
the head coach's job to come in and address the team when you're six and zero is oftentimes a lot harder than maybe after you've lost a few games, right? So, cause when you come in at six and zero, especially college guys, I remember we were there, like you got all the answers, coach, you can't tell me anything. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. All of a sudden now you get kicked in the chin a little bit. You're humbled. I'm maybe a little more eager to listen. Maybe I don't quite have all the answers I thought I did. So you guys have experienced the six game win streak and now a three game losing streak. So talk a little bit about that approach. Maybe not necessarily just at Syracuse, but I think there's so many young coaches that listen to this show. And I think that's such a valuable lesson is the hardest thing to do in all the sports is handle success. I've always believed that I teach my kids that every day I said, yeah, you, you should be able to come back to a great practice after you have a bad game on Saturday, but can you come back and have your best practice of the year after you were the MVP? To me, gonna, that's gonna, the challenge. I'm going to take, I'm going to take you two places with this. Cause I think yeah. the question is great. You're absolutely right. When you're in front of a, a six and O team and you're talking about the things they're doing wrong, they're saying, oh, Coach, you're just saying that because you don't have any. We did so much stuff right that you got to nitpick and find something that we're doing wrong. It's really not that bad. And you're and I, again, it has to do with the relationship that I have with you and you have with me where I'm going, wait a minute, guys. I'm serious. Okay, If we don't change these things, it's going to bite us in the butt. We're going to lose a football game if we don't change these things. And I don't want to have to lose a football game for you to receive what I'm trying to give you right now. If if we can receive it and swallow it and and listen, don't hear, listen to what I'm saying, we can stop this from happening and we can have a fantastic year. Uh, I really don't think that was the case with my team this year. I I really believe that we've had some substantial injuries like everyone else that affects our play on the field. And then the next thing people say, well, what about your, your backups? What about your... With the name, image, and likeness and the transfer portals, backups have changed. And, Greg, I, I, I saw the amazing things that you did, and, and you're saying, hey, they brought so-and-so in to take your job. Well, you probably had a bigger pay, paycheck than so-and-so, and now you had to. <laughs> not more <laughs> than Brandon. Not, you know, more than Brandon not more than Brandon. Brandon made more than me, just for the record. <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you a story about Brandon after this too, but you know, you, you've got to find a way, you've got to find a way to make the guys believe, okay, I'm going to give you a sidebar. I'm going to come back to this topic. This is a sidebar law. You know, the lawyers come up sidebar, Love it. just the judge talking. Brandon Manny Maluna, coach, I'm going to catch the football. Brandon, you're six feet and you're like 285 pounds. Coach, I have the best hands on the team. Watch this. At you didn't have the best hands on the team, but you had the best hands I've ever seen on a guy that was six foot, 285 pounds. This is, this is a conversation between Brandon and I. And, and he goes, well, coach, I need to catch the ball more. I'm calling the plays on the offense court. And I go, Brandon, I'll get you the ball as much as I can. But I got a first round pick at tailback, which I had. I've got a fullback that was a free agent that went to the Indianapolis Colts. I got a wide receiver that went to the Buffalo Bills. The other wide receiver went to the Oakland Raiders. That's how old I am. Okay. And the other tight end, not Brandon, the other tight end, got drafted by the Dallas Cowboys and played for the Dallas Cowboys. So I'm like, Brandon, there's a lot of guys on here that can get the ball. Now, let me tell you something. Because Brandon, his mom, I loved his mom, loved his mom. I said, Brandon, you love your mom and you love your sister. You want to take care of them. I'm like, this go. I said, so listen. I said, Eagle Scout. Brandon was an Eagle Scout, man. His freshman year, he was so young, he had to miss practice to go back to take the test become an Eagle Scout while he was in college. And he went back and took the test because he didn't want to, because he always told his mom he'd make the test. I'm giving up all of his stuff. So the bottom line, I told him this. I said, Brandon, if I teach you how to block and you block the right way, you'll play in the league for 10 years. I said, they'll always, I said, the league always will get a pass catcher and he'll always make more money than you. But if you know how to block, you'll hang around long enough that you'll make more money than all the pass catchers. True story. Okay. Love that. True story. Not done. Okay, now flip back to the team. So you've got to find a way to get those guys to really believe you, okay, really believe you when you're talking to them in those situations. Last thing, this is the second thing I was going to say. This is what I, and this, I told this to my staff. This is what I want to tell you to you. Young coach, okay, you coach your son's pop Warner team. I said this to my staff. I said, good coaches know when they have a good team. Coming back. This is before the season starts. You know, 
The teams are teams, but then you know when you got a team that's special. You know when you got, hey man, this is the team. We got everything lined up. This is the team. I said, I've never failed that team. This is what I told my coaches. I have never failed that team. And don't you guys fail this one? When you got that team and you got the stuff, you know what I mean? Yep. You gotta, you gotta bend it, you gotta burn the light at both ends, and you gotta bring that energy. You can't let this team down because this day will never come again. This season will never come again. You can't look back and go, hey, these guys went eight and blah, blah, blah. But I really thought they had the ability to go 10 or 11 wins. When you go, to me, my thing has always been double digits in college. You go double digits, you've done something. Yep. If you've got a double digit team, you've got to get it done. That's the pride that's inside the coaches that's got to carry on down to the players. Go, I'm done. I love it. Well, I, I think that's I think that's so important. And you alluded to the last topic that I wanted to discuss with you. And again, you're being very generous on your time. You guys got a huge game this weekend against Florida State, who just kicked the living crap out of my Miami Hurricanes. Um, so hopefully you guys have better luck. So I want to talk more about the NIL and just more in general, just the current college landscape. We've done a bunch of shows, a bunch of different, you know, perspectives with different families and kids and students. But from the coach's perspective, you've seen you've been around 35 years. So you've seen the NCAA that I play in and the NCAA from way before that to today. And it's very different today with the kids ability to transfer the kids ability to make money through the NIL. Like, what are the challenges that you face? maintaining your roster, maintaining recruiting, recruiting high school kids, like just give, give our audience a sense of what that looks like in real time that you're doing on a daily basis as you continue to build this program. Well, it's, 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 you're turning into a general manager of a national football league team without contracts. Yeah. That's the part people don't realize without contracts. And, uh, it's entirely, entirely different. It's entirely, entirely new. And you need to be green and growing, not red and rotten. And you need to bend like an R-E-E-D in the wind and adjust and improvise or you're going to get passed by. You'll become the dinosaur. And I'm all, I'm all for name, image, and likeness. I think the guys to get some change in their pockets, I think that's fine. I really do. And, you know, some guys are demanding i've seen heard about some amazing numbers that are out there for certain individuals and transfers and stuff okay i get all that but i just think that football is so much different than so many other teams that if you know if you give the one guy this what do you give the left tackle what do you give the center what do you give the fullback that blocks for the tailback what about the the holder for the place kicker i mean it's the whole thing about football is being unselfish and transparent and everybody dropping the E in ego so that we can all go to where we want to get to, which is normally a championship or, or a team goal that brings along the individual goals. You're an All-American because we're undefeated or you're an All-American because we won double digit games. And now Greg Olson gets to get drafted higher. So it, it's, it's a thing that's very, you have to very carefully balance and, uh, I think that it's still growing. I don't think everyone has the answers yet. And the dust is going to settle two or three years down the road. And then whatever that is, I think that's going to be the new college football and the new NC2A because it is different than when it all started. When I started in this thing, I think it was different when you played as well. Yeah, it was, it was very different even just when I played. But how do you manage that in the locker room? I think that's such a great point. I think everyone hears about the, especially some of these kids coming out of high school, they were getting these guarantees, these marketing collective deals and, you know, for millions of dollars or, you know, whether the numbers are real or not is really not the point. But then how do you not get division within the locker room between the haves and the have nots? We're all doing the same amount of work, but I might not play quarterback. Like you said, I might be the middle linebacker. I might be the defensive tackle. Or I might be, but I'm still doing the same workouts. I'm still contributing to the team's success, but I'm getting nothing. Like how do you, all, the, yeah. the crazy thing is the head coaches have nothing to do with it. It's all right. outside. It's all outside uh, groups that yep. are saying, "Hey, I like this guy. I like this guy. I like that guy. I like that guy." So that saves the head coaches a lot. But I think the biggest thing is is that the guys, the guys have to understand that you know we're not pushing one other person. It's other what other people perceive on the outside more so than what we perceive on the inside. And as long as the team moves forward, you would like to think there's enough for everybody. Uh, I don't think the thing that people need to remember is 
for 99% of the guys, you're not making NFL money in college. That's, that's not happening. Okay. You can't afford it. But, uh, I do think that there's some guys that, uh, are totally different that can drive, uh, TV ratings and stuff based off of what they've done in college. But they're, they're few and far between. And the rest of the guys need to be, you know, they'll get you what they can, what they can. But uh, they need to think, keep thinking about the team. And this is not where you're going to make your money. This is going to just make you live a little bit better while you're in college. Your goal is to get your college degree or to go to the National Football League and play 14 years and then get your own podcast and sit back and f- have a exactly. fabulous producer. I have an unbelievable that. producer. That's my life. My life's dream was to have an unbelievable producer. And thanks, thanks to you, I have one. I have two, actually, but you're only the father of one. So I don't want to leave Paige out. Well, I'll tell you what, you still had to choose Paige and that other one that we won't say her name. So you're, once again, your, your both power wonderful. of persuasion and They're your, both wonderful. your discernment is extremely <laughs> strong. They're both wonderful. I remember when coaches used to come sit in my family room and recruit me and my brothers. I had an older brother, the class ahead of me that went to Notre Dame out of sc- high school. And then I had a brother who was 10 years younger than me. So watching him go through it just 10 years after me was very, very different in the recruiting scene. But just thinking back to when I was being recruited and coaches would come to the house and my mom would cook dinner and we'd sit around the entire conversation, of course, was football related. Do you produce NFL players, your position to coaches, of course, but then it was academics, your degree. Here's what our school can offer you. Are those the same conversations now happening in the homes of high school recruits in today's day and age? I would say less and less and less, but not here at Syracuse because Our academic brand is so strong. That's why, you know, I, I gave a little shout out to yeah. that other school west of the Mississippi, too. When you've got those S's, they know that our academics are real. They know that if you get a, a degree from Syracuse University, whether that's an undergraduate degree or a master's degree, OK, that's going to talk. I mean, we can say what we want, but that's that's going to talk for you. OK, that's your brand. And it has a lot of juice. Okay. So uh, w- those conversations still go on uh, in our living rooms. I'm not, I can't vouch for the other, the other schools that don't have a brand like that. I think that the conversations have changed and uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. And, and the, the last thing, I got one more question. I'm going to let you go and get you back to game planning and, and go out and play Florida state this weekend. What would you say to all the families that are listening to our show? A lot of them have children that are entering the high school, you know, high school ranks and they're starting to think about college and hopefully they have a chance to play sports in college, male or female. If you had one with all your years of experience, both as a parent and obviously now as a coach, like if you had one piece of advice to help a parent guide their child, son or daughter on this path that ultimately could potentially lead from high school to an opportunity in college, what would you want them to know? Okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna try to answer it with a story. Love that. Okay. Um, my dad would not allow me to play Pop Warner football, and I'm gonna I know you're coaching Pop Warner. Just stay with me for a second. And I, you know, it's it's kindergarten, it's first grade, it's second grade, it's third grade. He won't let us play. Fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, he wouldn't let us play, and we're constantly asking, begging him. To let us play. We're, we go to the games every Saturday. We watch our friends play. We play in the streets and the parks with our friends. We know we're better than them. Yet he would not let us play. And it, it, it drove us to a point where we were getting angry about it. And I think then he finally allowed us to play. And I asked him, now my dad's passed away now. He's buried in the National Cemetery in Houston next to his brother. But I, I, I said, why won't you let us play? He said, first of all, you guys don't need to play. I'm watching you guys. I know how good you guys are. He says, I've seen, now this is for you, Greg. I've seen some of those other coaches and all they do is end up playing their sons and just ruining kids. Now I'm not saying all coaches are like that because that's, I know what this show is. What I'm saying is you need to go down and watch the coaches and see if those coaches are mentoring those young men in the way that you would like your son to be mentored. And if that's the case, then go for it. 
But where we were in, in, in those situations and what those coaches were doing with my dad having experience, he said no. And he said, I bet he, he bet on it. And he was right. He says, I'll get I'll let you guys play. He let me play in the eighth grade. He let my other brother play in the sixth grade. I didn't even know how to put on a uniform. High school started in the 10th grade where I was at. In the eighth grade, I did. Eighth grade was the first year I ever played, put on a uniform. And two years later, I was the first person in the history of the school with my friend. There was two of us. Oh, the guy I told you about, <laughs> my yeah. high school coach, yeah, uh, Mark Kennedy. Me, Mark Kennedy and I was the first two guys in the history of the school to, to make varsity as 10th graders. And we only had the uniform on for two. But so he, but he knew. So he really knew, you know, he could watch us and he knew, he'd like, no, you're, you're better than that. I don't want you guys to get all that information I just want you to get information from one guy and you guys will be able to make it. And he was right. I was able to get a college scholarship only having gear on for five years. So he rolled the dice right with me. But I think the biggest thing I would share is just to make sure that the, the young, the young coaches are, you know, coaching those young men in a way that you feel is appropriate and go to practices and watch. And if you have questions, ask the coaches and, uh, because I think there are fantastic young coaches out there, fantastic Pop Warner coaches. You just got to be careful sometimes with the drills. And I know with you, with all your NFL experience, you'd be perfect where this drill is realistic and this drill is not realistic. And the more I think that guys share, that college share with high school guys, high school guys share with Pop Warner guys, coaches, I mean, to make sure that that experience is favorable because we want as many got young men to love the game, to play the game the right way. And I still say, you know, I have basketball friends, basketball coaches. I've got all, I still say there's no other sport like football in making young men better fathers, better sons, better husbands. Well, you're not going to get any argument from me there. I grew up in a football house. Coach was a dad was a coach. All my brothers, we, you're not going to get any arguments from me, but that last story you told is so true. I, I never let, while I was still playing my, I never let my son play football because my, my thought was along the lines of your dad was you have a bad baseball coach. All right. You don't learn how to field. You don't learn the hit. Okay. We'll fix it next year. You get a bad basketball coach. You don't learn to shoot a lefty layup. Fine. You get a bad football coach. You can get hurt. You can get scarred. You can never want to show up again to a practice. You, there's so many negative consequences that come with having poor football foundational coaching. And to me, that's what it's all about. It's about laying the foundation that you can go to middle school, high school, and hopefully beyond on that journey. So I, that resonates very, very true to me because I just believe us young, you know, youth level coaches have such a responsibility for kind of teaching the kids the right way so that they can grow up one day to be recruited by you and come help you make Syracuse a powerhouse. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Go Let's Orange. Go. I love it. God. All right, Greg. That means well, you hey. got to come out for a game, and you got to bring Paige and that other that other producer. That other producer is fantastic, as is Paige. But, Coach, in all seriousness, thank you so much. You're awesome. It's been awesome getting to know your daughter through this show. She's fantastic. Thank you for joining us. I know you have a game. I know you guys are getting ready to play Florida State. Good luck. We always have an Orange segment on You Think, and... uh we're big fans of you and really respect and appreciate everything you've done. And thank you for your time. Greg, thank you so much. I got one question for you. Yeah. Right. It'll be my second question. Yeah. All those names I read off to you. Yep. Do you have any of their telephone numbers right now? I might have Lance Briggs. I might have Lance, but the other ones now I don't. Mm -hmm. So watch this. You've met, you've, you've left great residue with all those people. Okay. And you know, so many people I know, like I, I, I do know so many people, but you know what? I've got those, those telephone things. They just put in that contact and just leave it in there, leave it in there, leave it in there to be one every once in a while to sit out in the backyard and you're done with the kids and they're all put to bed and, and you've got a, you got a colorful iced tea and just to go back <laughs> and call one of those guys and uh, ask them about a coach Baber story for me. Done. See if it resonate with you. <laughs> done. That's a done deal. I look forward to it. I'm sure there's some good ones out there. All right, buddy. I appreciate, appreciate you, Coach. Greg. Good luck. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed 
that conversation with Dino Babers, head football coach, Syracuse University, Tasha's father, more importantly. Um, just really cool hearing his insight, his energy. He's got such a great uh, personality and a, and a passion for life and influencing these young kids. And he's obviously been in that for a long time now, serving these kids um, at all different stops along the road and all different, you know, both as coordinators, assistant coaches, as head coaches at multiple spots. So it's, it's really a, a, a big breath of experience and knowledge and, and, um, and just, just what a great guy. I just enjoyed talking. To him. I said, geez, Tasha, and your dad's ama- like amazing. She's like, yeah, yeah. You know, your own dad's never as cool as he is to everybody else, but um, he was awesome. So appreciate that. And now we will bring in on the day we're filming this, not the day you're listening to it. It is Tasha's birthday. So a huge day for Tasha. She's got her father. She's got her birthday. She told us her boyfriend's taking her to a matinee. We had to teach her what that was. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> so we're good. We're covering a lot here on you think, but, um, Tasha, what do you got for us today? Birthday girl. Um, I've just never seen movies during the day. Okay. I thought matinee was just a fancy way of saying movie like the nope. cinema. Nope. Okay, great. Um, Daytime anyway, movie. if you guys have more questions about that, you could send them in. But one of our first fan questions is from Instagram. They say, Greg, I'm a seventh grader and I'm a tight end just like you were. Um, any advice on how to get more exposure as a tight end? Yeah. You know, so I think first and foremost, I think right now as a seventh grader, I think exposure needs to be the least of your concerns. You're not getting a college scholarship at seventh grade. You're no, you're not a finished product at seventh grade. You, you know, you're not even ready to play freshman football yet. So I think my biggest advice to you would be continue to develop great work ethic, continue to great, develop great, um, habits, right? Whether that's your daily habits of how you prepare for school, your daily habits of how you prepare in season for games, studying your game plans, whatever your coach is asking you to do. And then in the off season, when you're not playing games, how do you take care of your body? How do you, how do you get a strength and conditioning program? How do you continue to fine tune? There's gotta be based on where you live in today's day and age, especially with social media, it's easy to find coaches. It's easy to find trainers. It's easy to find advice online that you can go do on your own. Like continue to find ways to develop routine habits and work ethic, the exposure, all that stuff will come. Don't worry about any of that stuff right now at this age, this time, middle school, getting you ready for high school is all about the foundational component of sports, whether it's football or baseball, basketball, soccer, whatever it is, build the habits that now you can build on as you hit puberty and you mature and you grow and develop physically. Are you going to be able to layer all of those things on top of a really strong foundation? Or is it just a foundation that's just chasing, you know, Instagram clips and likes and highlight reels? Like we, we live in such a mm-hmm. highlight society, but sometimes those highlights are built on faulty foundations. So I would say, don't worry about exposure. Don't worry about who's ranking you where and what, as crazy as that sounds, it's happening now younger and younger, just develop habits that as you continue to get older, you can continue to build upon. And that's every single day, how you eat, how you sleep how you prepare and do your schoolwork, how you train, do you condition, do you run, all these things um, that you can do that are in your control that at seventh grade are appropriate to do. And then by the time you get to high school, the rest of that stuff will take care of itself based on how good you are, or, you know, some of your qualifications and whatnot. But that would be my biggest advice. I, I don't love when young kids are so worried about recognition and exposure and rankings and awards and all that. Cause the reality is no one ever says, well, he was the best seventh grader. He was the best ninth grader. No, it's, Who's the best when it matters? And typically that's when you get, you know, to the upper, you know, the, you know, the upper school, high school, whatever you call it, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, 12th grade. That's really when it starts mattering. It's wild that in seventh grade, they're starting to think about exposure instead of just like, I know how to play the game and passing science. I hate it. That's wild, but they see it online. So it makes sense. Of course. I think like that. Um, our next one is from James. He says, how has the NFL changed since when you first got in the league? Well, I think it's changed quite a bit. And I think, you know, there's, this is probably a longer answer than this, than this will, you know, be able to suffice. So I think it's changed in just philosophy. I think it's changed in the manner in which teams play. I think a lot of that has to do with the way the rules have been changed to both increase player safety. Um, you know, you don't see guys getting blown up and hit and taking their legs out and quarterback. So there is an aspect that has protected players that I think is for the best. I also think there's a philosophical change where how people view offense and it's more of a passing league. When I came into the, into the league, you know, there was the, you know, there was still the Mannings and the Brady's and those guys, but it was run the football and play great defense and all that. And then it went through a really pretty seismic shift where people realize, you know, 
the passing game is so valuable. Defending the run is not quite as valuable. Like it started to become a little more analytical and people started to say, okay, what aspects of, of football actually lead to winning and lead to scoring points. So I think there's been a philosophical change. I think there's been a change in the players. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I think a lot of it has been for positive. I think guys are very aware now of their image. Guys are very aware of how they're perceived in society. It's, it's easier and easier to engage with fans. It's very easy to hear feedback, whether it's negative or, or positive. Um, guys are aware of that. So I think it's changed in a lot of ways. I think it's changed in a way they treat players, practice schedules. You know, we don't practice. They don't practice as hard. They don't practice as long. They're much more in tune with sports science and recovery. And, you know, I mean, so, I mean, there's this game from the, you know, 15 years ago when I got into it to the game is today, there's a million changes. And I would argue a lot of them are for the better. You know, some of them we'll see if, you know, it comes back full circle and the pendulum kind of readjusts, but yeah, I think the game is constantly evolving and um, I think the best teams do a good job of evolving with it. That's good. The next question you kind of alluded to in past episodes, but I think they asked it more direct. It's from Sarah from Instagram. She just says, would you ever consider coaching in the NFL, perhaps with Luke in Carolina one day? Well, I mean, if anyone's uh-huh. seen our Pop Warner success, um, the fact that we, we haven't gotten That's offers right. to coach is kind of a, is kind of a mystery. Um, Ridiculous. You know, I, in my heart of hearts, do I think I could be a good coach and do I think I would enjoy it? Absolutely. I don't have a doubt in my mind that I could do it and would like to do it. And frankly, I think I would be good at it. I do. I have, I will never do it. It's, it's not a lifestyle that I want. It's not something after all these years that I'm willing to pour the time and the effort to do, to do it right. You have to be obsessive. You have to, it has to be everything to you. You have to, and I'm just not willing to do that. I, I have too many other things with my family and my kids and, and other interests that I have that, you know, I just don't have the time or the energy or the, or the willingness to, to sacrifice, to put coaching and do it the way if you're going to do it, you'd have to do it. So it's not something I'm, I'm considering right now or something I really ever see myself considering, but there are days when I'm standing there and I'm like, man, I could do this. And I think I could do it really well. Um, but I probably will never get a chance to find out whether that's true or not. So in my mind, I'm a great coach. I just don't, I get to do it in the pop Warner ranks. <laughs> that's good. Well, not a fan question, but I'm wondering since it is Thanksgiving week, what's your, what's your Thanksgiving meal go to? I love stuffing. So I love Thanksgiving stuffing with some gravy, obviously the turkeys and all the normal stuff, but I love stuffing. So that is what I look forward to the most. Like I said, we're going to be in Dallas. I call the afternoon game on Thanksgiving day in Dallas. And then we're going to do like a crew Thanksgiving dinner at the hotel. Um, So I don't know what the spread will be. So we'll just make the best of it, but um, it's going to be fun. They better make stuffing or I'm not calling the game. Tell them. <laughs> That's your tradition. <laughs> I know. It's uh it's gonna be a fun, a busy week though. We got I got I just called the game yesterday, flew home last night from New York, back to Dallas tomorrow, which would be Tuesday. I'm filming this. As I'm saying this, it's Monday. So filming I, I would fly there on Tuesday, call the game Thursday, fly from Dallas to Kansas City Saturday morning, call that game. So we got a we got a big week ahead of us. So lots of prep and holiday and all that good stuff. That's good. Well, that's all the fan questions for today. Submit them at Greg Olson or at you think on TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter. Well, I appreciate you guys, Tasha. Thank you. Happy birthday. Yeah. Enjoy that matinee. And yeah, happy uh, Thanksgiving. thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Yeah. Enjoy it. And uh, thank you all so much. Ha- happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners. Thanks for following along. This has been a fun first year here on you think. Please continue to rate, review, subscribe wherever you guys get your podcasts and uh, hope everyone has a great holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. And we will see you next week.